The Time Machine by H. G. Wells Chapter 11 I have already told you of the sickness and confusion that comes with time traveling. At this time, I was not seated properly in the saddle, but sideways and in an unstable fashion. For an indefinite time, I clung to the machine as it swayed and vibrated, quite unheeding how I went. And when I brought myself to look at the dials again, I was amazed to find where I had arrived. One dial records days, and another thousands of days, another millions of days, and another thousands of millions. Now, instead of reversing the levers, I had pulled them over so as to go forward with them, and when I came to look at these indicators, I found that the thousands hand was sweeping round as fast as the second hands on a watch into futurity. As I drove on, a peculiar change crept over the appearance of things. The palpitating grayness grew darker. Then, though I was still traveling with prodigious velocity, the blinking succession of day and night, which was usually indicative of a slower pace, returned and grew more and more marked. This puzzled me very much at first. The alternations of night and day grew slower and slower, and so did the passage of the sun across the sky until they seemed to stretch through centuries. At last a steady twilight brooded over the earth, a twilight only broken now and then when a comet glared across the darkling sky. The band of light that had indicated the sun had long since disappeared, for the sun had ceased to set. It simply rose and fell in the west and grew even broader and more red. All traces of the moon had vanished. The circling of the stars, growing slower and slower, had given place to creeping points of light. At last, some time before I stopped, the sun, red and very large, halted motionless upon the horizon, a vast dome glowing with a dull heat, and now and then suffering a momentary extinction. At one time, it had for a little while glowed more brilliantly again, but it speedily reverted to its sullen red heat. I perceived by the slowing down of its rising and setting that the work of the tidal drag was done. The earth had come to rest with one face to the sun, even as in our own time the moon faces the earth. Very cautiously, for I remembered my former headlong fall, I began to reverse my motion. Slower and slower went the circling hands, until the thousands one seemed motionless, and the daily one was no longer a mere mist upon its scale. Still slower, until the dim outlines of a desolate beach grew visible. I stopped very gently, and sat upon the time machine, looking round. The sky was no longer blue. Northeastward, it was inky black and out of the blackness shone brightly and steadily the pale white stars. Overhead it was a deep Indian red and starless, and southeastward it grew brighter to a glowing scarlet, where, cut by the horizon, lay the huge hull of the sun, red and motionless. The rocks about me were of a harsh reddish color, and all the trace of life that I could see at first was the intensely green vegetation that covered every projecting point on their southeastern face. It was the same rich green that one sees on forest moss or on the lichen in caves, plants which like these grow in a perpetual twilight. The machine was standing on a sloping beach. The sea stretched away to the southwest to rise into a sharp bright horizon against the wan sky. There were no breakers and no waves, for not a breath of wind was stirring. Only a slight oily swell rose and fell like a gentle breathing, and showed that the eternal sea was still moving and living. And along the margin, where the water sometimes broke, was a thick incrustation of salt, pink under the lurid sky. There was a sense of oppression in my head, and I noticed that I was breathing very fast. The sensation reminded me of my only experience in mountaineering, and from that I judged the air to be more rarefied than it is now. 
Far away up the desolate slope, I heard a harsh scream and saw a thing like a huge white butterfly go slanting and fluttering up into the sky and circling disappear over some low hillocks beyond. The sound of its voice was so dismal that I shivered and seated myself more firmly upon the machine. Looking round me again, I saw that, quite near, what I had taken to be a reddish mass of rock was moving slowly toward me. Then I saw the thing was really a monstrous, crab-like creature. Can you imagine a crab as large as yonder table, with its many legs moving slowly and uncertainly, its big claw swaying, its long antenna like carter's whips, waving and feeling, and its stalked eyes gleaming at you on either side of its metallic front? Its back was corrugated and ornamented with ungainly bosses, and a greenish encrustation blotched it here and there. I could see the many palps of its complicated mouth flickering and feeling as it moved. As I stared at this sinister apparition crawling toward me, I felt a tickling on my cheek as though a fly had lighted there. I tried to brush it away with my hand, but in a moment it returned and almost immediately came another by my ear. I struck at this and caught something thread-like. It was drawn swiftly out of my hand. With a frightful qualm, I turned, and I saw that I had grasped the antenna of another monster crab that stood just behind me. Its evil eyes were wriggling on their stalks. Its mouth was all alive with appetite, and its vast ungainly claws smeared with an algae slime were descending upon me. In a moment my hand was on the lever, and I had placed a month between myself and these monsters. But I was still on the same beach, and I saw them distinctly now as soon as I stopped. Dozens of them seemed to be crawling here and there, in the somber light, among the foliated sheets of intense green. I cannot convey the sense of abominable desolation that hung over the world, the red eastern sky, the northward blackness, and the salt dead sea the stony beach crawling with these foul, slow-stirring monsters, the uniform poisonous-looking green of the lichenous plants, the thin air that hurt one's lungs, all contributed to an appalling effect. I moved on a hundred years, and there was the same red sun, a little larger, a little duller, the same dying sea, the same chill air, and the same crowd of earthly crustacea creeping in and out among the green weed and the red rocks, and in the western sky I saw a curved pale line like a vast new moon. So I traveled, stopping ever and again, in great strides of a thousand years or more, drawn on by the mystery of the earth's fate, watching with a strange fascination the sun grow larger and duller in the westward sky, and the life of the old earth ebb away. At last, more than thirty million years hence, the huge red-hot dome of the sun had come to obscure nearly a tenth part of the darkling heavens. Then I stopped once more, for the crawling multitude of crabs had disappeared, and the red beach, save for its livid green liverworts and lichens, seemed lifeless, and now it was flecked with white. A bitter cold assailed me. Rare white flakes ever and again came eddying down. To the northeastward, the glare of snow lay under the starlight of the sable sky, and I could see an undulating crest of hillocks, pinkish-white. There were fringes of ice along the sea margin, with drifting masses further out, but the main expanse of the salt ocean, all bloody under the eternal sunset, was still unfrozen. I looked about me to see if any traces of animal life remained. A certain indefinable apprehension still kept me in the saddle of the machine, but I saw nothing moving, in earth or sky or sea. The green slime on the rocks alone testified that life was not extinct. A shallow sandbank had appeared in the sea, and the water had receded from the beach. I fancied I saw some black object flopping about upon this bank, but it became motionless as I looked at it, and I judged that my eye had been deceived, that the black object was merely a rock. 
The stars in the sky were intensely bright and seemed to me to twinkle very little. Suddenly I noticed that the circular westward outline of the sun had changed, that a concavity, a bay, had appeared in the curve. I saw this grow larger. For perhaps a minute I stared aghast at this blackness that was creeping over the day, and then I realized that an eclipse was beginning. Either the moon or the planet Mercury was passing across the sun's disk. Naturally, at first I took it to be the moon, but there is much to incline me to believe that what I really saw was the transit of an inner planet passing very near to the earth. The darkness grew apace, a cold wind began to blow in freshening gusts from the east, and the showering white flakes in the air increased in number. From the edge of the sea came a ripple and a whisper. Beyond these lifeless sounds, the world was silent. Silent? It would be hard to convey the stillness of it. All the sounds of man, the bleating of sheep, the cries of birds, the hum of insects, and the stir that makes the background of our lives, all that was over. As the darkness thickened, the eddying flakes grew more abundant, dancing before my eyes, and the cold of the air more intense. At last, one by one, swiftly, one after the other, the white peaks of the distant hills vanished into blackness. The breeze rose to a moaning wind. I saw the black central shadow of the eclipse sweeping toward me. In another moment, the pale stars alone were visible. All else was rayless obscurity. The sky was absolutely black. A horror of this great darkness came on me, the cold that smote to my marrow, and the pain I felt in breathing overcame me. I shivered, and a deadly nausea seized me. Then, like a red-hot bow in the sky, appeared the edge of the sun. I got off the machine to recover myself. I felt giddy and incapable of facing the return journey. As I stood sick and confused, I saw again the moving thing upon the shoal. There was no mistake now that it was a moving thing, against the red water of the sea. It was a round thing, the size of a football, perhaps, or it may be bigger, and tentacles trailing down from it. It seemed black against the weltering blood-red water, and it was hopping fitfully about. Then I felt I was fainting. But a terrible dread of lying helpless in that remote and awful twilight sustained me while I clambered upon the saddle. End of chapter 11